Okay, in this tutorial, what we're going to be going over is recreating the Brick Breaker game. So, just coming through, uh, we're going to start simple and build this game as we go along. Uh, it might be broken up into a couple of different tutorials. But basically, we're just going to focus on the scripting of this and not the creation. So to get started, um, basically out here, anything that we have on the stage that we want to communicate with needs to be a movie clip. And these also need to have an instance name. So to give it the instance name, we're going to go under Properties, make sure it has an instance name. So on my ball, I just called it ball, and we can see it's a movie clip. On my paddle, just named it paddle. Again, it's a movie clip. Down below, we have a score field and a lives field. Now, with these, these are just text fields. It's classic text, dynamic text. You want to try to stay away from the TLF text especially if you plan on taking this into mobile devices or anything like that. And we might get into that later on. But what's the first step? Since we have these out here, we also need some bricks. Well, my bricks are not on the stage, but they are in the library. So I'm not going to bring these out and place them out here. I'm going to place my bricks through code. So we can see that this is a movie clip. We're not going to give it an instance name because we're going to do that through code as well. But to communicate with that in the library, we need to give it a linkage name. So inside the library, when you're setting these up, we're just going to right click, go down to properties, and export for action script. So when we do that, Export for Action Script, we can give this any class name that we want. Okay, I'm just going to leave mine called Bricks. We're going to say OK. It's going to come up Action Script Class Warning. Definition of the class could not be found. Just click OK. It doesn't mean it's creating a class file or anything, it creates it upon export of the movie. So, Everything else should be good to go. We don't need any other files. Okay. Now, out here, you can see I've set mine up in layers. I got my paddle on one layer. Got my ball on the next layer. My score field and my lives is set up in a HUD. And then I have my actions layer. Actions layer. So, this is where I get to spend most of our time is in the actions layer. Now, when we're going through and creating different games, take it one step at a time. Don't try to do everything at once. So, what would be the first thing that we would want to interact with here? And that's probably getting our paddle to move back and forth across the stage. Now, also notice my paddle registration point is on the center left-hand side. Okay, so let's come up, go into our actions, F9 to open up the actions panel. And since we are not dealing with the menu system, when we come to this scene, first thing we need is probably a stop command to tell the timeline to stop on this frame. Now we want to start moving our paddle. Well, there's a couple of different ways that we could do that. If we just tell our paddle, giving it that instance name, dot start drag, parentheses, true. In that parentheses, end with a semicolon. The semicolon is basically telling us that's the end of that line. Control Enter to test this. We can see when I'm moving my cursor around, 
it's moving that paddle around according to that registration point. Notice the registration point stays in line with the cursor. But I only want my, my paddle to go back and forth. I don't want it to go up and down. So we're going to set up some constraints. We're going to constrain that paddle to a rectangle. So to restrain it to a rectangle, we need a variable. A variable is just simply known as a container of information. Okay, so we're going to create a variable, VAR, for that variable. We're going to call it rec because it's a rectangle, colon, and we're going to give this a rectangle. It's going to equal a new rectangle, parentheses, we're going to start at 0, minus, parentheses, the paddle dot width, parentheses, comma, we need to tell the paddle dot y, what is the y properties of the paddle? So the first one is describing the x value of the paddle, comma, the y value of the paddle, comma. How far do we want to be able to go left or right? So I want it to be able to go all the way across the stage, dot the stage width. That's on the x value. X on the stage is left to right. And what is the y value? Well, I don't want it to go anywhere on the y value, so I'm going to set that to 0. Okay, so now coming down in our paddle.start drag, go right after the true, comma, rect. So it's going to start drag on the paddle using the registration point but it's going to be maintained within this rectangle that we just created. So now if we test this, you can see as I move my cursor, I can't go up and down because my Y value is set to zero, but I can go from one side of the stage all the way over to the other side of the stage. And it's wherever you place that paddle to begin with. Okay, so if I had my paddle set up here, that's going to be the position of that paddle. Okay, so you need to have it in the position that you want. So when we start moving it, it can follow that. Well, I don't want to see my cursor as I play, so I want to hide that cursor. So just coming under the stop, we're just going to say mouse.hide. So we're going to hide that cursor. So now that cursor will not be seen as long as we stay within that stage. If we move outside, yes, we can see our cursor, but not when we're within that stage area. OK. Next, we need to start moving the ball around. So to start moving the ball around, we need an event listener to tell Flash to look at this over and over again. So I'm going to come down a couple more lines. And I'm going to tell the stage, which is the control area. This is the stage. So we're looking at the stage out here that I want to add an event listener. What event do I want to use? Well, I'm just going to use the event dot enter frame event, all caps, comma. What do I want to happen when the stage sees this event listener? I want to call a function called game loop. Okay, so now we need to define that function. So function game loop. 
Okay, I'm going to put EVT for the event, and this is just going to be an event. Let's close that semicolon or colon void because we're not going to return anything from this. Open curly bracket, closing curly bracket. If you have set flash CS5, it will do that automatically for you or above. If you have flash CS4, don't forget, every time you open a curly bracket, you need to close a curly bracket. Now within here, I need to tell my ball to start moving. So I'm going to tell my ball, because that's its instance name, dot x, because we're looking at that x property, to equal the ball dot x plus 5. So I'm going to move it across the stage 5 pixels every time this enter frame event runs. Well, enter frame event runs as many times of the frame rate. So my frame rate is setting at 20. Well, we only have one frame. So every time this frame is entered or it sees this event happening, it's going to call this function. So we're setting at 20 frames per second. So it's going to call this function 20 times in one second. So it's going to move my ball 5 pixels to the right because I'm plus 5. So what it's going to do is going to take my ball, move it 5 pixels to the right 20 times in one second. So basically it's just going to sit there and start moving off to the right. Okay. Well, I'm also going to do that same thing on the Y value. So telling that ball.y to equal itself plus 5. So if we test this, we can see that ball is starting to move down. Well, it's just going on and on. Okay. A shortcut in writing this instead of doing it the long way, this is the long way, I'm just going to say ball.x plus equals 5. So my line 15 and my line 16 are saying the exact same thing. Okay, so I don't need line 15 anymore. Let's go ahead and do the same thing down here on the y. So plus equal 5 semicolon it gets that same results okay so now we got our ball moving around the stage well instead of hard coding 5 in here because I want to change the direction of that ball when it hits the paddle hits the side of a wall, the top of the screen. Okay, I want to change the direction of that. So instead of hard coding these, I'm going to create some variables up here. So coming under mouse hide, I'm going to create a variable called speed x. Okay, that's going to be a number. And that's going to equal 5. Let's create another variable, speed y. And that's going to be a number, and that's going to equal 5. Let's make sure we spell speed correct up here. So I'm going to take my speed x and put it down here. Let's do the same thing with the speed y. So now my ball is going to plus equal that speed value. Now I can change this value through code because I'm dealing with a variable now instead of a constant. Okay, so instead of hard coding that 5 in there, I can change that value. So let's come down, let's insert some spaces here, staying within these brackets for this game loop.
Okay. Now, if my ball leaves the stage or hits the right side of the stage, I want it to come back. If it hits the top of the stage, I want it to come back. If it hits the left hand side, I want it to bounce back. If it leaves the bottom of the stage, I want to lose a life, but I want to replace that ball back somewhere up on the stage as well. So we're going to start setting that up. So, and with that, we need a condition. A condition is basically just an if statement. So if my ball dot x is greater than the stage dot stage width minus the ball width. Now with that condition, those are within parentheses. So after that, we need an open curly bracket, closing curly bracket. Now if it hits that side of the stage, which is the right hand side of the stage, I want it to bounce back. So I'm going to tell my speed x to times equal a negative 1. Any value, if it's a positive value, you times it by a negative 1 becomes a negative value. If you have a negative value times negative 1, it becomes a positive value. Okay. I'm going to come down just below that and say else, put in another curly bracket. Well, let's do an else if. So else if my ball dot x is less than 15. Again, I want my speed x to times equal a negative 1. So this is telling me, check this. If the ball is greater than the stage width minus that ball width, okay, so here's my stage width over here minus the ball width. So if it hits that side of the stage, we're going to tell it to come back. If it's less than 15, so we can see we got 10. My ball's actually sitting at 16 right now. So if it's less than that, send it back. Okay. So to see this in action, let's go ahead and take comment out our ball Y movement. So we can see our ball is moving to the right. It's going to hit the side of the stage and come back. Ball is moving to the left because it's at a negative value. Hits the left hand side of the stage, becomes a positive value. Okay, if your ball is moving too slow, let's just go increase the speed. So let's give this about 10. So our ball moves a little bit faster. So we can see the ball is just moving left and right, left and right because we commented out this y value down here. To comment, you just put two slashes in front. So let's uncomment that, and let's set up the y value. So coming after this, if my ball dot y is less than 15, I want my speed y two times equal a negative one. Okay, that's telling me my ball is going off the top of the stage. And that should be the Y value. Okay, it's going off the top of the stage. That means my ball is less than 15. When we're dealing with flash, we start at zero on the X at the left hand side. The Y starts at the top at zero. Okay, 
as we go down in the y value, we add to it. As you come up on the y value, we subtract. So you can see over here on the right hand side, I'm setting about 50. Zero is right at the top. So that means my ball is coming up. If it's less than 15, I want it to go back down. Okay. Else, we want if our ball is off the stage, so else if my ball dot y is greater than the stage dot stage height minus the ball height, I'm going to take my ball dot x. And it's going to equal math dot floor. Math dot floor will round it down to the nearest number. Okay, I'm going to do a math dot random. I'm going to generate a random number based off of the stage width. So we're going to times that by the stage dot stage width. So how wide is your stage? And then I'm going to tell my ball dot y to equal about 200. Okay, so if we come out and look, 200 is about right here. Okay, that should be below all of our bricks that we have up here. If not, you'll move it down further if you have more bricks up here. I'm going to set mine about 200. So here's 200. So when I bring my ball back in, it's going to set somewhere across this line on a random value. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're creating a random number, the stage width, whatever that stage width is, okay, and setting that value floor. So it's going to give me a random number between 0 and whatever my stage width is. My stage width is set to 800. So it's going to give me a random value between 0 and 800. And it's going to take that ball and just make it equal on the y value to 200. So if I let it go off the stage, you can see it's just going to randomly start placing that ball at different spots. Okay, next we need to go through and have the ball hit the paddle. So we can make it bounce back. Okay, so we have it hitting the right and left hand side of the stage, the top of the stage, and if it falls off the bottom of the stage. Now we need to go through and check to see if the ball dot x, well actually the ball dot hit test object and what is it going to hit? It's going to hit paddle. Notice I got two closing parentheses. So I got an open parentheses for the hit test and an open parentheses for that if statement for the condition. So we have to have two closing parentheses. We we'll talk about hit test here in a minute. Okay. On the hit test, what do we want it to do? Well, if it hits the paddle, I'm going to do call another function. I'm going to call call ball angle. So I'm basically just calling a new function off of this. Okay. Now, to look at the hit test and see what happens with that, let's go in and take a look at this example in here. So, hit test object, we have 
two different shapes out here. One's a circle, and one's just a pentagon. Now, when we're doing hit test, basically if we move these two together, and let's zoom in on this a little bit, physically they are not touching one another. Okay? But if we look at these, it has a bounding box around it. These blue squares are the bounding box. Using that hit test object, it's looking at the bounding box around these objects. Okay. So if we look at this, we have that hit test object. Okay. So right now, I can move my circle around. We're not getting anything traced out. So you can see over here, we're tracing a number. Trace will put it into the output field. There's an output field over here. Okay, if I come in and touch, see we're starting to get that hit test to show up. But they're really not touching. They're looking at the bounding box of that. Okay, I'm going to comment this code out. So, let's see, what do all I need to comment out here? Let's comment this here out. And we're going to come down and we're going to uncomment the rest of this. Okay, now I'm moving our polygon cube around. Okay, now notice if I come in real close, we're not getting that message out anymore until I actually touch that. So I don't know if you can see that very good, but you know, I'm pretty close. I'm not getting any messages out, but if I touch it, we're getting a whole bunch of messages out. See how this is going down? So we're getting a whole bunch of messages out as long as I'm touching that. Okay, let's do that again. So no messages. But as soon as I touch that, we're starting to get some messages out there. This is a hit test point. Okay, we're looking at the point values of that poly cube on the X and Y values. Notice on the X values, sometimes I leave them alone. Plus 20. So we're looking at the registration point and adding 20 to it to get a point at this point, a point down here, a point over here, and a point over here, or a point over here. So right here, using that hit test point, they're not touching because we're not looking at the bounding box anymore. We're looking at that registration point and point values that we set up ourselves. Okay, at this point here, they are touching, so I would get that message. Over here, I wouldn't because they're not touching. I hope that makes sense to you guys. For our game, we're basically just going to use that hit test object. So we're going to look at the bounding box of that. Okay, so when we're going through, we're going to use the hit test object. These are moving fast enough and they're small enough, you're really not going to notice that on that hit test. Okay. Now, also, when we're using hit test and hit test object, if your ball is moving so fast, maybe you're setting up here and you have your ball coming down and it's moving 20 pixels per enter frame, that means, again, we're setting at 20 frames per second. If you have the value, speed value, set to 20, that means it could jump down to here within that first one and actually jump past that and off the stage before it even hits that collision detection. Okay. Hope that makes sense because maybe the ball starts here 20 pixels brings it down to here, okay, or the speed of 20. The next speed of 20 coming through would actually jump around and move that ball down here. So you wouldn't even see that collision detection because that ball is moving so fast, okay? 
So I hope that makes some sense. Now, when my ball does touch that paddle, what do we want to happen? Well, I'm calling a new function. So I got my new function here. So I'm going to copy that, come down past my closing bracket for my enter frame. OK, coming past that, and I'm going to create a new function for that calc ball. I'm not going to put any values within the parentheses because this is just a call to the function. But I still need void to end that. OK, now within this function, what do you want to happen? I'm going to create a variable called ball position. And it's going to be a number. And it's going to equal the ball.x minus the paddle.x. I'm going to create another variable called hit percent. Let's spell that right. Hit percent. And again, it's going to be a number. And it's going to equal, within parentheses, my ball position divided by the paddle dot width minus the ball dot width, double closings minus 0.65. That needs to be a minus sign. Now I'm going to tell my speed dot x is going to equal that hit percent times 10 my speed y is going to times equal a negative 1. So it goes back up. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking at where does my ball hit the paddle. If it hits the paddle over here, I don't want it to reflect off that way. So if it hits my paddle here, I'm going to send it back this way. If it hits it towards the center, I'm just going to bounce it straight up. If it hits it off on the right hand side, I'm going to bounce it off to the right. So that's what we're doing. And it looks like I didn't spell something correctly. So let's just copy this and let's paste it right in here. Spelling is a big issue. Capitals, capitals. Make sure everything is spelled correctly. So now you can see when I hit my paddle, it's going to reflect back to the right when I hit it on the right hand side. If I go towards the center, it's going to hit back straight forward. If I hit off to the left hand side, it's going to reflect off to the left hand side. This gives me better control over my ball's positioning and where I want it to move. Okay. Otherwise, you'd just be sitting here, the ball would be bouncing back left and right every time it hits, and you would take longer to complete the game. And people might get start getting frustrated. Okay, with that, I'm going to end this tutorial, and in the next tutorial, we'll go through and finish this up by bringing in our bricks.